and we're recording. So welcome everyone to everything you need to know about yoga and trauma recovery, how to respond to trauma in a way that helps instead of causing more harm, because that's what we're trying to do, right? So the first thing I want to invite you to do is practice something that in yoga we call dharana. Dharana means single pointed focus. Okay, so what does that look like? That looks like not going backwards. <laughs> I have to tell you in terms of single pointed focus, I was prepping for this this morning and um, the cat climbed up the window screen right next to me and just fell on my desk and spilled everything all over. So it's a miracle that my keyboard is even working right now. So we're very excited about that. <laughs> So when cats are jumping in your face, it's not easy, but just in the world today, it's challenging to keep focus, right? We're constantly distracted. There's pings, there's dings, there's all of that. So as much as you can, uh, if you could silence those things, turn off your phone, focus in, close out other tabs, whatever you need to do to be here now. So phone off, tabs closed. I like to go full screen, audio up, and to just practice being in the moment as we do. All right, so some of you are just meeting me for the first time, so I want to let you know, you know, why I'm talking about yoga for trauma recovery, what I've been to, and, you know, where I've been with it. So I am a licensed marriage and family therapist. I'm also an experienced registered yoga teacher, a certified yoga therapist, and a continuing education provider for Yoga Alliance. I'm the founder of the Center for Yoga and Trauma Recovery here in the San Francisco Bay Area, host of the How We Can Heal podcast, some of you have listened to, and I've written three books. I'll be giving actually a couple of them away at the end. This year, I'm president of an organization called the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, and I graduated from UCLA, Go Bruins, and Harvard Grad School. So I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time. I'm really passionate about yoga and trauma. I've used yoga to move through my own healing. I've supported tons and tons, thousands of people, trained hundreds of people in using yoga for trauma recovery. So enough about me. I want to know about you. So pop in the chat. You guys are familiar with Zoom, yeah? Go ahead and pop in the chat and let us know where are you joining from. I'd love to see where you're coming in from. Oh, okay. Hi, Debbie. You're showing up as Jen. That's cool. We'll call you one or the other. Oh, I love this. Okay. We got San Ramon in the house. Leah, Boise, Cincinnati, Long Island. Shout out to Long Island. Heidi, say hi to the big duck. Salida, Colorado, Westport, Connecticut, Ireland, San Diego, Potomac, Michigan, Victoria, BC, Minnesota, Utah, New Jersey, England, suburb of Chicago, Bismarck, Quarryville, Modesto, Chicago, SF, Stockholm, Sweden. Oh, yes, it's late for you. Thanks for hanging in. Jenny in Finland, same for you. Thanks for hanging in. It's late there. Lithuania, American, Antonio, Canada. Got my Canadians in the house. Houston, San Francisco, Charlotte, Ottawa. I love this. I love all of this. So we've got people from all over the world, people from all across the U.S., Costa Rica, Ireland, Ontario, Canada, all the Canadian love. Awesome. So I want to point this out and highlight and have y'all look in the chat too, because it's so important that we feel connected these days, right? And we're all here and we all care about the same kind of thing. So now I want to know like, what kind of work do you do? Are you a mental health professional? Are you a coach? Are you a wellness expert? Are you just kind of popping in for your own understanding? Let us know in the chat. Probation officer, student, love it. Social worker, mental health professional, trauma therapist, yoga instructor, mental health dance, LCSW, Pilates, financial coach, yoga for trauma recovery teacher, hospice volunteer, eager amateur, occupational therapist, adult ed, art therapist, wellness coach with domestic violence, yoga instructor and horse physio. Oh, yeah. Getting MSW, therapist and yoga teacher, school counselor. All right. So lots of wellness, some OT, some mental health, some judicial stuff, probation officer, private practice. All right. So again, we're in good company. A lot of us are serving folks who have experienced trauma in different forms, right? Okay. So 
Another question, and this one that might take you a little moment to think about. I'm just curious. Like, I'm curious. <laughs> what are you curious about? What's coming up for you in this work? And what are some of the questions that come to your mind? Is it how does yoga work with trauma recovery? Is it what do I do when I, I deal with a really complex client or patient? So you don't have to drop this in the chat right now. If you have a burning curiosity, please do. How can I implement yoga in my work? Absolutely, Jennifer. Ginger. Um, keep this question alive as we go through, because I do, we have some time at the end for Q&A, and I do want to make sure that we have just that space for discussion, and there's so much that's been happening in the world these last handful of years, and so it's, um, there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot to talk about, there's a lot to be curious about. How I can interact with people in a way that's trauma-informed, bringing yoga into therapy sessions, yes, yes. Okay, and my biggest question for you uh, as we get started here is how are you doing? I mean, is it just me or has it been rough? It's been rough. And I've heard people say like, there's never been a time in humanity when it's been this bad. And then I'm like, well, there's kind of always something, right? You could go back and say, well, what about this time? Well, there was the plague or there was World War, or there was whatever. But we, I think, have just been struggling and we've been struggling a lot with trauma, right? With resolving really deep <laughs> current trauma as well as systemic long-term trauma. So yes, uh, Julie just wrote, thriving despite the pandemic. The pandemic's been an ongoing exposure to threat and stress and isolation. So that in and of itself is enough, but as we know, that's not all. Hey, Leah, doing well, taking care of yourself. You have. I haven't seen, I've seen you on Instagram. I've seen you rowing in the gym. I know you are taking really great care of yourself. So good. And we're going to focus on that today. Focus on taking care of ourselves and each other. So I'd love to see if you have the little emoji thing up on your screen, just like you can pick an, an emoji. Can I do that while I'm up here? Maybe I've got too much going on. You can throw up an emoji about how you're doing. You can drop it in the chat. But I just want to validate more than anything that like it has been rough. We have been through a lot these past few weeks, months, and years. And our nervous systems are, are strained, right? They're a little all over the place. Now, many of you have probably heard about, studied about, thought a lot about our nervous system and about the nervous system. We're going to talk about it a little bit today, but mostly I just want to validate that we have, with all these strains, been through the ringer. Yeah, I've got the smart glasses, the sleepy, the funny face, Independence Day was depressing. Yes, agreed. There's a lot going on. And so it's important that we tend to our own system and that we're aware of how we're connecting, how we're co-regulating. So self-care and community care, Leah, shout out to your self-care, are as important as ever. Obviously, we can't fix all of this with bubble baths or pedicures or some of those more, um, I don't know, self-maintenance or um, it's almost like what's the word, you know, like showers and stuff. It's just very sort of basic physical care. We need something much deeper right now. And I think what we really need is tools to help us process and recover from trauma. Okay. And I also think we really need connection. Again, the reason I kind of went into the daunting back end of Zoom so we could see each other's faces today is it's really important that we're able to connect and that we're able to um, make meaning together, feel each other's presence and, and co-regulate. So as we know, we've been isolated, we've been distanced, there's lots of opinions, there's lots of stressful challenges. I wanna highlight here, our need for connection is very deep and biological. So it's, it's not something we can just override mentally and say, oh, it's okay, I'll be all right. Or, you know, we can absolutely do the best we can. And, you know, if we're alone for a long period, meditate, but our, our need for that deep communal connection is very biologically wired. Uh, I attended two live trainings earlier, earlier this year, one with a mentor of mine. And uh, I got so much energy just from being in the room with folks that I really felt like we should do this. So 
this is what we're going to cover today. Okay, okay, okay. I want to talk about what trauma-informed yoga is, give you a basic outline of that, talk about why it matters, I want to share some of the biggest mistakes I've seen. Um, both new and actually really experienced providers, also researchers, make when they're responding to trauma and what we can do instead of that. So it's kind of a shift in orientation. I'm also going to cover what most training programs still don't teach about responding to trauma. Can I just see a show of hands? Those of you who have um, graduate, graduate school training or, or mental health training, like how many of you had trauma included in your coursework. Oh wait, I lost you. Let me use a little arrow. Raise your hand if you had trauma included in your coursework. I see very, hi Suzanne. I see very few hands. Okay, raise your hand, anyone. Oh, there's a hand, oh, there's clapping. Okay, Julia, good, awesome. So raise your hand now if you have had any formal training in trauma. Okay, more hands. You had to seek it out, right? You had to find it somewhere. Trauma sensitive. Awesome. Yeah, good. Okay, cool. So we find it because we need it, right? And there's some pieces of trauma that have caught on and there's some that I think are just catching on, thankfully, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm also going to talk about three popular practices, actually, that I love, that can sometimes do more harm than good, okay? So let's start with just what is trauma-informed yoga? Somebody mentioned trauma-sensitive yoga. There's trauma-conscious yoga. There's a lot of different, I'm going the wrong way. That's the cat water in my keyboard. There we go. Um, there's a lot of different approaches, right, that, that we can take in different methods or sequences we can practice. Trauma-informed yoga is the general kind of umbrella term for the approach to yoga that integrates awareness of post-traumatic stress, including the causes, the symptoms, and the pathways to recovery. Trauma-informed yoga prioritizes, and this is where it gets different from, from other modalities, prioritizes the biopsychosocial, spiritual, and energetic needs of the student or client over the goals of the class or instructor. So in maybe a public yoga class, you might have, um, as a teacher, some of you in here are teachers, you can have a lot of different goals, right? You could have a theme, right? Like a, a, phil a philosophical theme or a postural theme, <clears throat> but you can also see times where there's a whole culture or a whole system that's kind of going in a direction and we haven't really asked, is this what's best for the student? So trauma-informed yoga prioritizes what's best for the student. And that can change, right? So that can get complex. Now at the heart of pretty much every helping profession is this commitment to do no harm, right? So when a practice is trauma-informed, we're trying to minimize the amount of harm and maximize the opportunities for healing. So what happens if the teaching or the leadership is not trauma-informed, and I think it's important that we're aware of this, is we can actually cause harm even unintentionally. It might be physical, mental, emotional, social. Uh, I've definitely been in yoga classes where I've seen harm happen, both physical and emotional, social. We can also risk exploitation where the students are serving the physical, mental, emotional needs of the leadership. And we can also see this sort of longer term, especially um, path to disempowerment, where a student becomes overly dependent on the teacher or the community or even the method. So they can't even think for themselves or ask the question, what do I need and answer that. So we want to be really mindful and bring in this approach and, and just be aware of some common mistakes. So I'm going to outline some things now and we'll go a little bit deeper into this as we move forward. So how many of you have heard the term trauma vortex? Just a little hand in the air. Uh, a couple. Okay. I see Michelle. I saw you waving. See a couple of people raising their hand. Beth. Uh, okay. So trauma vortex just describes like this power, right? That trauma has. And I, I think as a collective, like we're kind of in it right now. We're in, there's so much happening that you turn on the news or you go on social media and it's like, we can get sucked in really quickly. So a common mistake, even with trauma treatment or treatment centers is really 
getting pulled, uh, either consciously diving into the trauma, like, let's just get in there, or getting pulled into the trauma and the dy dynamics around the trauma. This happens so often. I've worked with so many nonprofits. I'm the president of a nonprofit right now. I swear all I do is just try to self-regulate and keep stepping onto solid ground and staying in, in an orientation of healing. So we'll often dive into the trauma. We'll just get stuck swimming around in it. We'll also centralize the emphasis on the harm rather than the care that's either available or um, the capacity for care within the individual. And this is not wrong or bad, it's just an impact of trauma sort of overwhelming the whole system, the whole person, right? So we'll get really pulled into the narrative and sometimes this can feel like a lower V, lower capital, not capital V, victimization, right? That sort of like energy of victimization, different from being a victim of a crime, right? Super common mistake, even with friends and family, is just to push someone to tell the story of what happened when they're not ready to. You know, like a veteran comes back from war and it's just like, tell me what happened. It'll help you. That might be the case, but there's a lot of skill involved in terms of going from that place of overwhelm and have, carrying a story that's, that's too much, that's traumatizing, to expressing it in words. And some people never express things in words and can still experience healing. And the last thing I'll talk about uh, is just centralizing interventions over relationships. So as we get evidence-based practice, we can even do this with yoga. We're like, here's the sequence. And we forget that it, this is really, we're relational beings. We need connection and we need um, certain almost nutrients out of that connection. So if we centralize an intervention, it becomes kind of sterile and disconnected, which is going down the path, um, going down a path we just don't wanna go. Not so helpful. Yeah, and it is going down the path of also disconnection, which kind of alludes to dissociation. And this is one of the big things that it's very rare to see even in professional training programs to this day. And when we talk about complex trauma and dissociation, we're talking about serving the people who have been the most abused and harmed in our culture, right? So to not be aware of that, we can see how it's kind of, we don't want to be aware of it, it's hard, but to not be aware of the process is really doing a disservice to the people who, who need these skills and tools the most. Yeah, you guys with me? <clears throat> So I invite you all, awesome, thank you, Robin. I'm gonna invite you all just to take a moment right now to connect with in whatever way it serves you and whatever way um, feels most helpful, the energy of peace, okay? Now this is a practice of resourcing. This is a photo I took two days ago, two days ago at uh, my roommate's farm in Sandy, Oregon. I think I saw Oregon on here. If anyone's in Oregon, Slice of Heaven Farm. These are their vegetables. They are beautiful. Uh, it's an organic farm out in Sandy. And I took this photo because it was beautiful, but also because seeing nature is a huge resource for me and seeing people lovingly caring for the earth and the ground and each other through healthy food, like all of that is such a huge resource for me. So I'm going to invite everyone now, wherever you are, however you are, even if you're listening in, even if you're driving, you know, you probably want to keep your eyes open, but just to invoke a sense of peace. Now, this photo might bring that for you. It might not, there might be something else. You might wanna place a hand on your heart or take an easy breath or imagine someone or something that symbolizes peace for you. Dalai Lama, Buddha, religious figure, anything. So let's all just take a moment, just a breath or two to consciously invoke that feeling of peace. and to bring it into this group and to share it with each other, to amplify it. And then just notice any little micro shift, I just got the chills, any little micro shift happening in your body, in your experience, might be subtle, might be profound, but just observing any little shift that comes from that moment of connecting with peace. 
Okay, and then let's carry that forward. Know that you can come back. It didn't take that long, right? You can come back and you can do this again pretty much any moment in time. All right, now let's envision. Ooh, petting your dog. Yes, right? Petting your dog, that feeling of peace. I don't know. I have two dogs and one of them, he's real hyper. So I got to calm myself to calm him. And then he just <laughs> barks right through the roof. Sometimes calming, but definitely loving, right? Even when it's energetic. So now let's envision kind of the opposite of some of the risks I was talking about earlier. At the heart of our helping professions is the commitment to care right? To care for ourselves and for each other, to show up, to figure it out, right? To, to do no harm. And yes, to learn the skills where we're not hurting each other intentionally, unintentionally, but what's replacing that? What's the energy we're seeking? We're seeking to provide, we use this term all the time, providers, right? We're providing care, whether we're in mental health, physical health, something else entirely, providing service and care. And then what happens when teaching or leadership is trauma-informed? There's nurturing that happens. Students and clients identify their needs. They can find ways to get them met. There's growth, both for students and clients and for the providers of the care. There's increased awareness. There's personal growth that happens when we're in a really deep healing dynamic. And there's also empowerment. So when we come from this place of interdependence, kind of leaning on each other, staying centered, but knowing we can sway here, we can sway there, we can, we can lean and look to others for support, that tends to feel more empowering. So just like we did with envisioning peace, can we envision this is where we're going? We're committed to care, we're committed to offering an experience that provides nurturing, growth, and empowerment. Well, this is, as I said, I love nature and I love plants. This is a little kind of aside, but very in line. A little lesson on what we can learn from plants, what we can learn from lettuce growing at Slice of Heaven Farm. So some of you may have heard this quote before. It's from Thich Nhat Hanh, who passed recently. Uh, when you plant lettuce, this, if it does not grow well, you don't blame the lettuce. You look for reasons it's not doing well might be the fertilizer, more water, less sun. You never blame the lettuce. Yet if we have problems with our friends or family, I'd also say if we have problems internally in the wake of trauma, we often blame something. But if we know how to take care ourselves, the people will grow well, like the lettuce. So blaming finger pointing has no positive effect, nor does trying to persuade with reason or argument. No blame, no reasoning, no argument, just understanding. If you can understand and you show that you understand, you can love and the situation will change. So I find that this really applies in terms of understanding trauma, but also just in terms of understanding care, right? What's the environment that this person needs in order to um, facilitate their growth, in order to facilitate their processing of the traumatic thing that happened. I think this is one of the reasons why, you know, yoga in general, and there's definitely exceptions to this, but yoga in general does a great job of creating a really safe and nurturing space and container. And then people move and they breathe, connect with their bodies, kind of connect with what's going on internally. And especially when we have a pretty solid uh, background or, you know, maybe it's, it's one trauma, but there's a lot of good in life, then we can kind of sort through that thing. Right. So when we have that container and when we get the opportunity to get our needs met, we flourish, we grow, we heal. And it's important that we incorporate our bodies in this process. So another plant metaphor, I'm just full of them today. <laughs> Some of you may have been trained as I have in cognitive therapies, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, dialectical behavioral therapy, which is kind of like yoga in a different package uh, or mindfulness practices in a different package. But there's a lot of um, like, I'll see this on social media and articles online, very cognitive approaches to 
like the serious, serious trauma we're going with. And I think cognitive approaches are helpful, but it's kind of like pruning the leaves at the top of the tree, right? So you're like, I'm going to practice gratitude. Um, I'm going to interrupt that negative thought loop. I'm going to, you know, sort of manage the garden of my mind. Super helpful and really powerful and good to do. But what's the use of pruning a plant if you haven't watered it? Like, what about the rest? And so, I mean, even when you look at our nervous system, right, it's like there's, <laughs> there's roots going down. So what about paying attention to our bodies and the somatic work that we do and paying attention to our bodies from a very basic standpoint, food, water, sleep, right, exercise, Leah hitting up the gym, right, all of that matters and sets the foundation for the rest of our experiences. So when we're attuned to our physiological needs, but also our somatic emotional needs, we're watering the base of the plant. And then from there, I think it's even more powerful from there to start to sort of prune the thoughts and tend to the garden that way. There's a lot of um, metaphors, right, in meditation of like tending to your mental garden. And it can start to feel like mindfulness, 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 we're like all up in our heads. And so heartfulness, <laughs> bodyfulness, all of that, we're not separated, right? There's definitely a lot going on up here in terms of neurology, but it's all throughout our bodies and we've got to tend to the roots. <clears throat> so earlier I mentioned some common mistakes. What can we do instead of those? We can look for what feels better. We can look for relief, release, support. Especially as providers, we can identify strengths and resilience factors in the people we're serving and in ourselves. Super important, especially this goes back to the sort of telling of a story. We can process things and learn to process things in small bites. Uh, I mean, I'm sure most of you here have at some point in time gotten really eager and literally bitten off a bite of something that was too much to chew, right? It's like, uh, it just, it, takes longer to process when we do that, right? So when we are looking at processing trauma, rather than going right in, diving into the trauma vortex, trying to figure everything out at once, which there's plenty of urgency for us to do, we can take little bites, make some habits, start biting off and chewing little pieces. We can also ask, are we in the trauma vortex or are we in a healing vortex? A lot of things have momentum, right? When we kind of step into one, step into another, we can feel like a pull to go one way or the other. And so this question, you know, you might at times, especially as a practitioner, have one foot in each, like we're trying to dip into here and we're trying to ground back over here. Uh, but just that awareness, especially if you're leading a, a organization or a nonprofit, super powerful. And we can shift, this is that foundational shift from trauma, 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 which is super important to understand, to resourcing ourselves and others, to grounding in what we do want, to identifying our needs and moving forward with them in mind. And also really important is that we continue to centralize our relationships. So, and I'll say this later, but a recent conference I was at, slide said, all interventions are risky if you don't know your clients. So we can't just take, you know, there, there's very few things we can kind of take a template and just kind of go through it with a human being. The more personal it gets, the more it's about our relationships and our experiences, the more we really need to cultivate that connection in order for, um, uh, for there to be a, a safe space for healing. Making sense? You guys with me? Yeah? Cool. Okay, and then the last thing here is to keep learning about dissociation. So that's what we're going to dive into in a moment here. What too many people miss uh, and forget to ask is just the context, like the, this is the, um, the environment the lettuce is in, like what happened? There's a really popular Oprah book now, Oprah and Bruce Perry, what happened to you? What environments have you been in? What environment have we all been in for the past couple of years? And questions I want to emphasize is also to keep in mind what's right with you, person recovering from trauma, and what's right about the behavior. And dissociation is a really adaptive behavior that happens way more often than I think we think. I have 
uh, Marianne Kate out of Australia has a, a prevalent study. I want to quote it at 10% internationally, but it's somewhere around there. And the interesting thing is when we do research in this field, <laughs> we're not necessarily looking out for the people who've been harmed the most because a lot of popular strategies help a lot of people, right? They're, that's why they're popular. But when you look at research and how many of you do have experience in research? I mean, not, not too much, a little bit. I see some nods, I see some shrugs, I see some waves. Uh, so this part's important and I'm gonna share a little story about it in a moment. Um, Lots of popular strategies help people and that's great, but that's where we're serving folks who probably didn't have, you know, a really tumultuous childhood or haven't had like the most horrific things happen to them growing up. If you have ever done research and, and I've done research both at UCLA and at Harvard, you see the selection process, right? And when you look at studies that are trying to streamline, they're trying to identify, okay, let's just find these three factors that people have, or this one factor that people have, people who have complex histories and presentations get excluded really often, right? So they're like, oh, that's too complicated. Oh, they're on too many medications. Oh, they have too many diagnoses. They're not going to go into this study. What does that do? It leaves out the people who are having the hardest time, right? So... So I just want to put this, put this out there and just tell you a quick story. Um, I started my podcast one because, and Suzanne's here, she was there, was in a meeting with Gabby Bernstein and she was like, you need to start a podcast. And I was like, I have a note in my phone with like five pages worth of notes for a podcast and guests I want to have on. And you're one of them. And she's like, I'll be your first guest. So that was one reason. But the other reason is I was listening to this podcast religiously <laughs> this neuroscientist out of Stanford for a year, like literally I was training for a um, iron woman, iron person. And I was on my bike and I was listening to this podcast like every week for a whole year. And then this person did a podcast about PTSD. And I like just dropped my head on the table with the information that they were putting out. And this is someone who's very smart, but they went to the research and they said, oh, look, Things that I agree with are true, but don't help the people who need it the most. Oh, EMDR is good. Oh, you know, you should tell your story. Oh, things that are going to help the people who need a little bit of help, but they're not going to help the people who need a lot of help. So as providers, sometimes our own anxiety gets in the way. We're like, I got to be a master. I got to help. I got to fix. I got to change. I want to know what's going on. I read the research. I know all the randomized control trials. And sometimes we're, you know, just wanting to do something. Let me get in there. Let me just do something and, and, and figure it out. Like, I'm going to tell someone to tell the story. I'm going to, we got to go back and process the memory. We got to focus on the trauma. I um, asked permission to tell this story. I have a client and they've been on their way out of a, a domestic violence relationship and uh, a session recently, we talked about how really happy, I think, fulfilled they are in, in the volunteer work that they're doing with animals. We talked about animals. We talked about the event coming up with the animals. We talked about all the things, <laughs> you know, the cuteness of the animals and the people and the relationships and the planning. So easy to think as a provider, I actually had this thought, do I need to bring up something that we need to like, is this avoidance? I think it's fair to ask, like, is this avoidance? And I know, I know with this person, it is not avoidance because think back a month ago and it was really hard to try to connect with those positive feelings. So positive feelings might've been like five minutes of the session. We had a whole session of positive feelings. It was incredible. And even with me teaching you this and even all the training I have, there's this little like, should like, oh, well, if I'm going to write Medi-Cal notes, which I don't have to do anymore, but I used to, if I'm going to write Medi-Cal notes. We have to, you know, have to have some intervention or something. this is the intervention. The intervention is grounding into the goodness. The intervention is connecting with people. Intervention is recognizing what feels good and focusing on it and living there. Yes. Okay. So what can we learn from really severe cases? People who've been exposed to, and I won't go into details here, but ritual abuse, commercial sexual abuse, horrific um, family trauma, I'm talking like incest, 
really challenging things, how do they tend to present later in therapy? What symptoms do they tend to have? What is, what is more common for folks with those experiences to present with? Dissociation, right? Because this is how we cope with horrific things. Our bodies, our minds sort of split them apart, hide something away, leave it for later to deal with. It's very adaptive. It's very smart. It's very challenging to live with, especially if you get to the, to the place of DID. And perhaps some of you in here have experienced this yourself. And so in the yoga world, we often talk about calming the nervous system, bringing it down, right? We've got a really fast paced world. We bring it down. That's all fine and good. But in dissociation, we usually have a collapsed nervous system and some very, you know, and this gets, we use models that are simple and we're all very complex. But when there's, we get to the point of dissociation in a traumatic experience, it's usually because something's been so heightened that we've then shut down, collapsed out, disengaged, right? So what about when you need to trace back through that process and maybe you need to connect with some anger or cultivate some, some energy? You know, what about connection? How does that fall in here? So when we're talking about the nervous system, and this is so common, I mean, any sort of things I click on, which I try just to not do on my phone in general, they're like uh, calming the vagus nerve or, uh, or calming your nervous system or even balancing your nervous system. I think we really want to create a nervous system that's dynamic and in terms of internal systems isn't stuck in um, in a pattern of, of collapse or dissociation or, or is able to find tools to move in and out. That's what feels best for the person, right? In general, is to able to sort of connect and move in and out and to not be hijacked by the nervous system into different states. So what does it look like to incorporate dissociation? I just wanna say for those of you, where'd it go? For those of you who aren't familiar with this term, if you're just hearing it for the first time, dissociation, we use that word just to talk about disconnecting things, separating things. I could dissociate the movement of my uh, arm from my rib cage or right? anatomically you can do that, right? But in terms of a psychological sense, there's a separation of mental processes that are normally related. And dissociation tends to be not being aware of something. So we wanna bring in awareness, right? Dissociation is that numbing to prevent the pain, to give time to get to safety before processing. It's adaptive, it helps us stay alive. And if we're aware of this, we can support the people that have experienced these really horrific things in understanding this is just your body's way to respond. So in order to be dissociation informed, we want to understand our freeze response. We want to incorporate that it's not just bringing our nervous system down or even lifting it up. It's finding ways to be dynamic and move in and out of states to be able to be sad and then, and then find another place. Like the example I was giving earlier, having a hard time and then really relishing in the volunteer work with animals, right? We wanna understand how this is protective want to value the somatic, our bodies and our nervous system, and take a very slow paced approach. One of the leaders in the field of dissociation says, the slower you go, the faster you get there. Uh, and that's just the example of like biting off a little bit and chewing it one day, one moment at a time. So we orient to building awareness and relationship while maybe mitigating the dissociation. So we're not reenacting it. Reenacting dissociation would be not being aware of it, which is basically what our society has been doing and even the mental health field for a long time. So I want to call out a couple interventions that can go off. Does anyone remember um, Dave Chappelle when keeping it real goes wrong? Okay, maybe not. Maybe it's just me. I used to watch it. Okay, yeah. So I was thinking about that as I was putting this together. And sometimes, you know, we can think, Oh, you know, exposure therapies. Yes, to Dave Chappelle. Thank you, Carolyn. There's a couple of people in here who remember. I loved watching when Keeping It Real Goes Wrong. It was hilarious. So exposure techniques have gotten really popular. I have a colleague um, I almost went into a program with who, who does a lot of exposure therapy. And I think, again, if we're working with um, 
that some colleagues used to call it like the worried well, people who are generally doing pretty well and have a solid um, foundation in life in, in a number of ways, socially, emotionally. And then exposure techniques might be good for, you know, a fear of garbage or um, spiders. I would always want to know where that came from and do the trauma work, but sometimes, you know, we can just go into exposing ourselves to the things that scare us if we have a solid foundation. All right. So with exposure techniques, we're going to expose ourselves to the thing that brings up a reaction. So it's different though, if it's to something that brings a sense of fear or if it's to actual memories of trauma, right? So the goal is often to access the strong emotion in the moment with the support of the therapist. So, you know, that's not that far out there, right? That, that's something a lot of therapists and wellness providers we do. We try to sort of support people through a hard time. Here's a picture from the top of Mount Diablo. This is Andrea, a friend of a friend, running friend. And some of you might have a fear of spiders. I don't particularly love tarantulas in my hand, but this is her with a tarantula in her hand. And I wanna just imagine for a moment that that tarantula is, represents her trauma history, right? If someone went through something really horrific, especially as a kid, what do you think the impact's gonna be if they keep bringing that closer, if they put it in their hand, if they bring it closer and closer? It's gonna have an impact, right? Something's gonna happen internally if we take this like horrific experience and memories and we bring it in. Like activation's probably gonna go up. What, what would happen to you if you took that tarantula, someone put it in your hand, what would happen in your nervous system? Anyone in the chat? Retraumatizing. <laughs> yeah, it's like, let's bring this awful thing in, All right? Trigger, All right? Maybe some hyper arousal. Oops. Activation and then freezing or avoiding. Yeah. Retraumatizing, not to mention the shame. Yeah, because I'm supposed to be healing and, and it didn't really go that well. So one thing I want to point out, for any of you that are seeking therapy or are therapists or are working with therapists or are panic attack. Yep, Jen, totally. I kind of love spiders. So is it weird to like it? No, totally fine. You can love spiders and you can bring that in. It just, that's not representing the trauma for you then, right? So any of you working with a therapeutic lens, and this can show up in yoga classes too. I've seen people sit down with, you know, someone having a hard time in class and and work with things. And, and so this is information that's super helpful to know in those contexts. So if the first reaction, especially if the first reaction was dissociation, something happened when someone was young, it was too much later on in life, I'm gonna go to therapy, I'm gonna do this exposure therapy. Okay, now I'm back in the room and I know we're gonna talk about the tarantula. <laughs> it's in the room already, right? Already there's gonna be a reaction. Now, if that thing was too much in the initial experience, and then all of a sudden it's back in the room while well, our response is gonna kick in, right? And if we take that thing and we bring it closer and closer and closer and closer, most likely our body already learned how to deal with it once, most likely our body's gonna have the same response again, right? It's just gonna shut off, it's just gonna shut down. So knowing that it just feels so obvious and basic, right? And knowing that and remembering what we've covered earlier of like, what about the healing vortex? What about how it feels to be peaceful on that farm? What about building up that energy so that if the tarantula crawls in, it just kind of walks across and goes about its way because there's so much other resource there. There's so much support, right? that that we can move one little spider step at a time through that difficult thing. So this is my biggest sort of flag in terms of things that I'm hearing and seeing is that exposure techniques and, and the research doesn't always incorporate, doesn't incorporate the dissociative process. So you measure, how do you feel? Oh, well, I, I, I feel okay. Now I feel activated. Oh, now I just feel, you know, I went back down to a zero why, right? And so we need to incorporate that awareness in order for this to go well. So we also need to be extra aware of dissociation with things like exposure therapies I just mentioned, 
EMDR as well. Um, I did training in EMDR about 10 years ago, and I remember a couple of us asking about dissociation, and, and it was usually like a refer out kind of question, like, oh, yeah, that might be different. Definitely talk to someone who has awareness. I think that's starting to train to change. I don't know if any of you practice EMDR or if you're uh, providing it, but... <laughs> If we don't know what to do with dissociation, we need to get training in that and we need to learn how to pick up on it because EMDR can just unpack everything at once and then we're kind of back where we started. Now this might surprise you, but also movement-based therapies, right? Good old yoga and meditation. We want to be aware that the ask to close your eyes and go inside might be a lot. Is someone asking what EMDR is <laughs> or why EMDR is on the list? I can answer that in a moment if you want to say, Patty. Even things like yoga meditation, close your eyes and go inside. Well, there might be a lot happening in the body. There might be a lot happening in the mind. Yes, eye movement, desensitization, and reprocessing. Thank you, Ashley. It's a form of trauma treatment. And so these are just things to be extra aware of as we go um, into a healing process. And the slower you go, the faster you get there. So there's lots of ways with yoga and meditation to orient to that support, that field of health, right? To resource ourselves first and to build that rather than to go into the things that are triggering. Okay, so as promised, I'm just giving you guys as much as I possibly can in this time. So I'm start to wrap it up. In terms of neglect, uh, which is also a form of trauma, right? We need to be able to support people who've been harmed the most. We don't like to think about this, but there are people who are experiencing commercial sexual exploitation. There are children who are abducted by no fault of their own. And as a, as a profession, not as a single person, because as a single person, that's just way too much to carry. And I always remember that earth is carrying me. I'm not carrying everything else. But as a profession, it's really important that we keep this awareness so that we're able to support the folks who have had the most horrific harms done to them so that we can create a safe nest for them to return to. And it's also super important that we remember any intervention is risky if you don't know the person you're working with. So it's easy to sort of poo-poo it, I think, especially in the research world, although there are papers that study, oh, wait, yeah, it is a relationship that's so powerful. But to come back to just being with people and just being open or curious or available for, for connection with you know, appropriate boundaries, like that can be so helpful and healing, okay? So we danced around in a lot of different ways, but I wanna recap and make sure I fulfill my promise to you. Biggest mistake I see new and experienced providers make, rushing into processing, completely ignoring resourcing, not knowing clients before offering an intervention, ignoring dissociation. What to do instead? Release urgency. Get to know yourself, the people you serve. Be an ongoing student and look at how our brain and body set the stage for symptoms and behaviors. What do training programs not teach? They don't teach about dissociation. So it's up to us, you know, as individuals, if we're experiencing it or as providers to get curious, to keep learning. You know, I'm the president of an international society on trauma and dissociation. I do not know everything. If you pull together everyone in that organization, we do not know everything. We learn with every single person. The most important thing is just to be aware of the fact that it exists, to be aware of dissociation. And the popular practices I mentioned that can do more harm than good, some of my favorites. We gotta be skillful here. We gotta be skillful when we're processing trauma, whether it's through exposure therapy, which I, I personally tend not to recommend because I've just seen, um, seen hard reactions. But to EMDR, same thing, it can unpack a lot. We can go slow with that. We can go slow with yoga. We can be skillful with meditation. Um, and we can absolutely focus on building up all that resource through those practices. And that's always an option, whatever practice you're doing. I think if we have that fundamental shift in orientation to building something that feels safe and helpful and positive, all of that can help, okay? So what do you need to know? Trauma lives in the body, not just our minds. 
Some targeted interventions can be disorganizing with the comp most complex forms of trauma. When dissociations at play, they can be just too much too fast. And any intervention, all interventions are risky if you don't know your client or student. All right, so that's our recap. Of course, there's like a ton, a ton, a ton more, and you see how much I packed into 54 minutes already. <laughs> if you're working with trauma survivors, there's infinite complexity out there. I spent my entire career creating resources to share this stuff, share what I've learned, help and support you, develop relationships with you, because I know a lot of you on here, and even the ones I don't know, I think you're pretty awesome. So I'm going to give away some of my books. I've written three of them. <laughs> Also, my audiobook just came out. The intro is free on Audible for everyone. And I've created programs. I've got Y4T, hands in the air if you've been through it. I see a few of you here. I'd love to see you here. Yoga for Trauma, that stands for. I've got an advanced training program that's nine months and a train the trainer program that's just starting now. Yes. Hey, Tracy, I see you. This summer, I have something new I'm so excited to share with you. And this is for everyone, even people who've been through Y4T before, and I'm gonna send you an email about it. I'm doing a live training this summer. I'm gonna do a live summer immersion, which is gonna be three weeks, starting July 18th, ending August 3rd, which happens to be my parents' wedding anniversary. We're gonna focus on building community. We're gonna focus on building this foundation of education. We're gonna focus on connecting with each other and building energy, kind of like the live trainings I just went through. I was so jazzed at the end of them and I wanna share that feeling with you. We also have some diverse yoga practices coming in from the advanced training graduates. So you get a sampler, a little poo-poo platter of what it feels like to go through a yoga class that's focused on yoga for trauma recovery in different ways. And you'll have the opportunity to connect with people all around the world. So what does it look like? We're going to talk about mental health, just like we talked about today. We're going to get deep into identifying the impacts of trauma. We're going to befriend our nervous systems. Identify really simple somatic tools we can use when folks are in crisis. We can use these for ourselves. We can use these for others. We'll also explore and identify some core components of trauma-informed care. And then we'll have a closing review, just like today, I did the recap, right? So you know what you're walking away with, did the closing review, and we'll celebrate at the end, okay? We have a bonus training, and actually, this is going to be up for a vote. We might change the focus of it, but what I've been hearing from folks right now is they're having a hard time, like, sharing. How do I talk about trauma? How do I tell people I'm working with trauma? Depending on who I'm working with, they might not know they're traumatized, or that might be triggering to talk about it. So we're going to talk all about that. I also want to hear from you. Everyone who joins the program will be able to have a say and a vote. So got a little bonus at the end. You are invited if you're a yoga professional, practitioner, mental health provider, coach, wellness professional, anyone who's just eager to learn about yoga and trauma recovery. Okay, we're going to cover a lot of stuff and we're going to focus on resourcing and building skills. And... This is who you'll meet. Here's some of the advanced training grads. I think Adriana's on here today. Give a wave if you are. I don't see you. Okay, maybe she wasn't able to join. Adriana, Shailene, Jeanette, Belinda, Maria from Spain, and Tara Tanini, who had, was one of the first training program, Y4T training program participants in 2015. So I haven't done a live program since 2015. It was the first time I'm doing it. Super excited. You'll get to practice with Belinda. She's in Michigan with Adriana in Chicago with Shailene from New Jersey with Maria from Barcelona. Tara is super great, right, Heidi? Thank you, Suzanne. Love you. Uh, Tara from New York and Jeanette from Canada. All right, so we've got an international crew of amazing practitioners who will share their skills with you. And I'll share a lot with you too, but it's just, it's not all about me, you know, <laughs> it's just really not. I just am really passionate about this stuff. So enrollment for this program is open now. You can go to howwecanheal.com back, backslash live to join. Tested everything this morning. It's all working. So you can go ahead and register there. We have a one-part payment. We have a payment plan. We made it as affordable as possible. Really want to build the community, okay? Uh, I just saw a direct message to someone who didn't get the link. Totally going to send you the recording, Rhonda. Don't even worry about it. We got you. We got you, okay? So enrollment is open at howwecanheal.com backslash live. If you have any trouble, let us know, because like I said, tested everything this morning should be working well. You're welcome. You're welcome, Viana. 
So we also have an enrollment bonus for those of you who are super excited to jump in. I've got a bonus group consult call for the first 15 people to enroll. So this is what our group consult calls look like sometimes. I don't know if you're up for that. We have a good time, uh, but we also talk about some really important things. All right, so I really hope you'll join. I, you can walk around, you can walk away from this program with solid foundations in trauma theory and yoga practice an experience of these diverse somatic practices and how they impact you, new connections with peers all over the world and ongoing access to the recordings so you can revisit them as often as you like. All right, so many nuggets. Thanks, Joan. All right, so that link again is howwecanheal.com backslash live. I'll send an email with the, this recording to everyone. So I saw some of you had to kind of drop in and out. No worries, you will get the recording and we'll send this link as well so you can direct click on it. <clears throat> And now we've got a little bit of time for Q&A. We're right at one o'clock, so if you have to hop up, I know there were a couple questions that came in that I flagged. So I'm just gonna take maybe five minutes to respond to those and I'm gonna go full face and stop the share for a second and just say, hi, how are you guys doing? Is it different than the previous Y4T? It's gonna um, cover some similar things. And Jenny, you'll get a special link for Y4T grads. You're welcome, Heidi. You'll get a special link to join that way. Uh, so some, same, same, but different as they say in Thailand. <laughs> so if you've got a burning question, pop it in the chat. I'm gonna answer um, this one that came in at the beginning. Uh, Susie asked, when I was certified to offer free trauma-informed yoga for wildfire trauma, we were given business cards with the NAMI contact, um, National Institute for Mental Health, uh, for warm line support that we can hand out. My question is, what's the best approach when I notice someone may benefit from this support? What are the best choice of words, especially if it's a first-time attendee in my yoga class? I often uh, see people trigger tears. Sometimes it feels awkward. Okay. So here's, and this, another question came in, and I think the same answer. When someone <laughs> is having a hard time, the best go-to that I can recommend is to just ask people, what kind of support do you have? Because most of us, you know, we might resist support, but most of us can say, oh, I don't really have support with this, or, oh, you know, I have my therapist, or I have this person or that person. Uh, the other question that came in is about a student who is using the after class lobby, so for a yoga class, to tell her story of a very traumatic history. Is this part of her healing I should not interfere with? Uh, it's, it's, in, it's beyond my scope of practice to bring that to her attention. Could I suggest she see a therapist? What are the best words? So again, I would say, what kinds of support do you have? If students are complaining to you about what's going on, you can offer some boundaries around time limit, hanging out in the front area. You can offer some boundaries around content, say something like, hey folks, if you're hanging out after, please just be aware, sharing your story about what's traumatizing might really upset someone else. So just be mindful of that. Uh, you can also set some boundaries around location, right? Like, hey, if you're struggling with something, we've got this resource board with other places out in the community or contact lines. Uh, so that would be my suggestion there. So I'm just going to check the Q&A or the chat, see if there's any other burning questions here. Lots of thanks. Thanks. Yes, you're so welcome. Lots of love to you all. I've got time for maybe one more question. And you know, we haven't done this yet. Does anyone want to unmute and ask a question? Go ahead and go down and do the little raise hand. Emily, hey. Hey, uh, uh, are you familiar yourself? with myofascial release therapy? I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Test, test, test. Hi. I just turned up the music. Hello. Hey, Lisa. Can you hear me? No? I can hear you, but that's hilarious. I think my Spotify is still playing. <laughs> Wilson Phillips. Have you guys been listening to that the whole time? No. no. Okay. <laughs> that would be amazing. Oh, recording to go down in history. Okay. Now I can hear you. Go ahead, Emily. Are you familiar with myofascial release therapy? And their um, their approach is that once the therapy, once the effect works, you don't talk about it anymore. So I was just wondering if you could speak on that for a second. Once the effect works, you don't talk about it anymore. Do you know the reasoning? 
Um, their training posits that it's uh, it's a still point releasing of the vessel van der Kolk, the trauma locked in the body. And once you've had a physical unlock, that you have processed all you need to process. I would be wary of that for this reason. And, and I want to encourage everyone when there's something that we're like, what do you think about this? What's the reasoning behind it? Just like if you're if you're teaching a yoga class, what's the reason behind your sequence, right? Why? Like being able to say, oh, I chose this because it's this, and I chose that because it's with the theme or whatever. Just having a reason, super powerful, right? So under, I don't fully understand the reasoning behind it right now, So, but my first few thoughts are, one, it sounds like a pretty rigid rule, and I tend to, you know, go more with the um, context and, you know, if this, then that, if not, then this kind of mapping of things. So I would want to know why in a deep way. And I feel like anytime I've done a protocol where there's a rule that's really rigid, I end up meeting someone who for some sequence of events, some reason is an exception to that rule, right? So I want to know why, because if someone were the exception to that rule and I were to say, hey, you know, we're going to go back to we don't go back to this thing because it's going to make, we're afraid it's going to make you feel worse. But then if they tell me, no, it's making me feel better, then I got to defer to them. That goes back to the sort of trauma-informed approach of we defer to, to what, and we figure it out because it's not always super clear, but we figure out what's going to be helpful, what's going to be the least harm and the most care. So does that answer your question? I, I wouldn't go with, it's hard for me. I mean, I've just had a lot of experience with these things in yoga and otherwise where it's like, you, you trained a certain way and then someone shows up that's the exception. And I, I've found that like that curiosity and listening in that phase is gold, right? And even talking about, I'll just share with people, hey, in my training, they said this, you know, and this is why they said that. And they're like, yeah, but that's not what's happening with me right now. And I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's explore uncharted territory and maybe I'll get some consultation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'm glad that's aligning. Thank you, Emily. Well, it's great to see so many of your faces. I know some of you went off, but I can still see your, your glam shots and your, and your blossoms on trees and all the other things. So it's been really great to connect with you today and get to know you a little bit. Love for you to join me this summer or just, you know, hang around, listen to the podcast, tell me who you want on the podcast. I am just loving running that. And, um, yeah, super excited to keep sharing with you guys. I did want to say, uh, I think pandemic wise, myself and a lot of people, we've hit this like wall of like, I have no more energy. And, and I really think a lot of that comes from, yes, coping with trauma, but also like not having fun or having like those little silly moments that happen with friends when we're just hanging out. So what I found in, in participating in a few of these lives trainings was just, oh, we can kind of goof off and we can be together. And, and so there's sometimes when we're in that place of like clunk, you know, stuck to the couch, sometimes we really need rest. And I've seen a lot of stuff out there like rest, rest, rest. Yes, we do need a lot of rest, especially in a busy culture. We also need like excitement, right? We also need these times where we feel connected and we feel together and um, all of that just feels really valuable for me this summer. I have a couple of colleagues who took a sabbatical and I thought about doing that. And then I was like, no, I want to be with my people. I want to like build some more momentum around all of this healing stuff. So that's where I'm at and I support you wherever you're at. So glad you joined me here today. Thank you for taking the time. Thanks for sticking around a few extra minutes. I'll be sending you guys all the recording and and wishing you tons of love and care and all the wonderful things in the world. So feel free to unmute to say goodbye. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. So glad you're Bye. here. Thank you. Oh, where's Wilson Phillips? I can't out. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thank Take you. care. Bye. Bye. Love you, Lisa. Thank you so much from Canada. Love you too in Canada. Thanks for being yeah. here. Uh, my pleasure and, and welcome and best of luck to all of you caregivers. And uh, this is an awesome program and so timely. Thank you, Patty. Thank you, Patty. So great to have you here. Yeah, so, okay, we'll take care and let's yes. go make a difference to people. 
You too. Take great care. Lovely to have you. Bye bye now. Thanks. Bye. -bye. bye.